All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 16th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. And it's a Monday, which means yesterday was Sunday. And I have a church report to give to start with. I I'm, I want to do this. I do this early in the morning, uh, usually after I get up, uh, because I want to... I, I often spend some time in bed before I actually get up. My my mind turns on. I begin to meditate on, on things. And before I get up and turn the computer on and get my head full of what's going on in the world. Uh, but yesterday, went to church. Uh, had to go by myself. My wife got a cold. Uh, bad cold. Or something else. Who knows nowadays. They may have invented another virus out there. Uh, you never know. What, what, what are they doing all those bio labs over in Ukraine? <sighs> We should be glad the Russians found him, that's for sure. Who knows? Uh, the military does not experiment with viruses for the purposes of public health. Uh, Fort Detrick doesn't exist for the purpose of public health. Let me let you know that. You don't have to know the top secrets to understand what they do. You have to know human nature and just a few facts and... Just extrapolate from it's just it's a little inductive logic there will lead you to the truth uh, almost always because human beings the Bible is very clear what fallen human beings are and what fallen human beings do and they act consistently with their natures all the time so uh, anyway so I went to church yesterday and I, I was not uh, I wanted to go but on the other hand. The pastor started on Daniel. And what do Baptist pastors do in the Old Testament? Whatever they want. It's just a springboard to say what they want to say. And this was totally consistent with my experience. My, what is it, 48 years now of experience as a born-again Christian? Oh, my and and yet that you know this is the best church I can find around. I mean, it's 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 just a good church. I mean, if I was going to pastor a church, again, this is the kind of church I'd want to pastor, not a a church full of people that aren't regenerate. Uh, you know, like a church of Christ. <laughs> yeah, they might believe the Bible, but they're not born again. It doesn't matter. Uh, and that's the problem with Baptists is sometimes they confuse believing in the Bible, uh, that the Bible is the Word of God, with being saved, and they're not the same thing. Uh, you could believe every word in the Bible and still be lost and go to hell, because it is not faith in the Bible that saves you, it's faith in Christ. The Bible is the witness to Christ, it is not Christ himself. You have to have faith in the, in the person, you have to have that relationship with God that comes through faith in Christ. Get that in right away, I guess, because so many people turn out after a few minutes. And I can understand that. <laughs> I tend to go on. But anyway, the uh, the pastor uh, took, I think it was technically supposed to be first chapter of Daniel, verses 4 through 7. He expanded that a little bit. But, man, what a... I was, I was really tempted, but God gave me some tolerance to, to, uh, to gently subtly rebuked the pastor by by saying my that was a creative sermon i would have never come up with all that stuff from that text because it was just a cornucopia of material there apparently i think the title of his sermon was dare to be different and then he take that all over the place including how how blessed we are in god's providence 
to be born in the United States. It's like, wait a minute. What about all God's people that are born other places? <laughs> what? What is? What? Is it? We don't think in those terms. See, that's a problem. Is is? Uh, uh, although this church, I looked at the statement of faith, and they do believe in a, a universal church too, about the local church. So they're they're much better. I have to talk to the pastor sometime because is, is a statement of faith all that you have to believe? I mean, or, or do you have some hidden stuff stashed away in the file cabinet, like a church covenant? And uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Although some churches may have that, but they simply ignore it. Um, which is might be the best thing to do with it. Yeah, that's that's Christmas past. <laughs> Back has old history. We don't pay attention. That's what our ancestors decided to to write one time in a in a uh, a state of confusion. But this 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 church is a you know they love God, they love Christ, they are born again. I'm I'm sure there's some that aren't, but I mean, generally very good. If I was a, it's a kind of a church a pastor would be happy to to serve. I was almost going to say have, but I mean, that, that wouldn't be proper. It's like the attitude, you're, you're, you're supposed to be the servant. Uh, and too often Baptist pastors don't have that attitude. Uh, although it's, I haven't had bad experiences with independent fundamentalist Baptists generally. I mean, I recognize there are some that are uh, bad, <laughs> but I, I haven't experienced that. Uh, and actually... Uh, actually having the uh, the opportunity on uh, occasions to speak with uh, pastors on a peer level, you know, that it makes a difference uh, when you're with. One of the things the pastors experience is that they're, they're too separated from the congregation. Um, and they almost have to be in some ways, especially unless it's a real small church. I believe in small churches. That's God's plan. Jesus had 12 disciples, or 12 apostles. Uh, when it got too big, he drove them away. There are too many followers here. I'm going to have to weed these people out. Let's see if they'll actually hold to me, or they'll be offended. So he deliberately offended them with the truth. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a winnowing, and this church has shrunk. The parking lot's fairly full, but, but it was... It was you know, this is not the summer season, so it's churches tend to shrink during the summer. But it's a good church. And they want revival. They they want more of God. They want more of the reality because they know they're in, uh, I know exactly where they are. They're in the, uh, the, well, in other churches, you'd call it the sacramental roller coaster or something like that. Sin, forgive. Sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness. That's where I was as a born, uh, before I was born again and after I was born again for a number of years, too. Uh, where after you're born, you actually want to do what's right. You actually want, before you're born again, you don't. It's like, oh, God is that up there with that stick, you know, the like the nun with the, the ruler in her hand or something that's going to slap you down. Uh, but it was uh, being raised as a Lutheran. It wasn't uh, that, but it was still. It was the that you sin and you ask forgiveness. You sin and ask forgiveness. Sin and ask forgiveness. And it was a daily thing. <laughs> and th then, of course, when you grow up, it's still it's even worse because you're confessing every Sunday in Lutheran churches. Uh, we have sinned against. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Well. Where there is no law, neither is there violation. Christ fulfilled the law. It's gone. It's done. And this is one of the problems with Baptists, although they are not Protestants. They aren't. Protestants are simply Reformed Catholics. They are. They are indeed. To one degree or another, they're simply Reformed. They're, they're all... Uh, sacramentalists not the reformed as much but it's still there and they're still bound to law uh, Luther's catechism and I'm speaking as a Lutheran because I can speak with more authority about Lutherans having been raised in it 
uh, in a moderate Lutheranism. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sectarian. I believe that Christ, his presence in you is what makes you a Christian. If you don't belong to him, you're not a Christian. If you do belong to him, you are. And if you belong to Christ, you're my brother or my sister, period. Uh, you're born again. His spirit's in you. And that is the basis of fellowship, not the basis of being in a particular sect, which is a sin against Christ. But there's, you know, we have to live in the world that we're born into. But uh, as a Lutheran, it kind of, there's this, there's this, what is this? This split personality in Luther, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and then he turns around and writes the small commandment, our small uh, catechism, that we all had to memorize. Three years of confirmation, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. Uh, then, I don't know what they do now, or Catholics, it's like, yeah, you're confirmed by the time you're like seven, and for the Eastern Orthodox, hey, when we baptize you, we give you communion right away. <laughs> There's none of that uh, education that has to get involved at all. I don't know, I'm not I'm not mocking. I mean, they're, they're every every group has some pluses to it, if you, if you look hard enough. Uh, Roman Catholics, I mean, a lot of Roman Catholics are very devout. Very devout. And a lot of them aren't. <laughs> Probably a whole lot more aren't. But the, the problem is, what are, what is their faith in? And I think often it's in the church, the institution. Yeah, they have faith in Christ, but the church is between them and Christ. Are you born again? But I was thinking this morning, looking back in history, I'll get back to the Lutheranism in a minute. Uh, thinking about the Puritans, thinking, were those people actually born again? And it has to do with what I'm, gonna, I'm talking about here. Uh, were, were the Puritans born again? Why were they, they were, what so happens, you know, the Reformed in, in a general way, but you see people that go into Calvinism in a hard way and they become hard people. I think that's, even they would confess that. And the Puritans, I mean, they were, they you would not want the Puritans for your neighbors. As a born-again Christian, you definitely would not want the Puritans for your neighbors. What did they do to Baptists? Beat us? Locked us out of our own churches? They were nasty. It's their way or the highway. <laughs> well, it's better than the Reformation. It was their way or the deep six. Yeah, you, you, you Baptists, we have a way. We'll give you another baptism. We'll tie some rocks around your ankles and throw you in the river, which is what they did. <sighs> the Anabaptists were Baptists. They, they came to it from the scripture. Yeah, well, 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 this is what the Bible tells us to do. Now, uh, but just getting baptism right isn't, baptism doesn't save you. But that, I don't, they didn't actually believe it did either. But it's, uh, but the, the Puritans, I mean, they were obsessed with sin. They talk about navel gazing. They were always obsessed with their own status with God and, and, uh, man, I, I don't know how could you live with that, and and if you actually get to the core of Calvinism with the, with the eternal decree, the the uh, the utter predestination of all things in exhaustive detail, how can you worship that God except in fear? What's the point? Whether you worship or not, your 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 salvation is predetermined, or your damnation is predetermined. You were created for that purpose, all to the glory of God. Yikes, that is ugly. And when I when I finally understood that, it's like, you know, it, it's, I think uh, the, the so-called Reformed Resurgence, which is now dying out, thank God, was, and it, it, it ran through its course, like all the other Christian fads. Christians are always looking for the the magic pill, the, the, uh, the elixir of life or whatever that will, that will bring them perfection and, and that will help them overcome their their weakness. Uh, we all search for that, I think, if you're born again. And I did. I did. And But being raised as a Lutheran, 
confirmation is what do we have to study in Luther's small catechism? We had to memorize the whole thing, including Luther's exposition. And there may have been something on baptism, the uh, the sacraments, the L baptism and the Lord's Supper, although some Lutherans hold to confession too. And I'm sure some of the ministers would like the uh, the priesthood too, if they could get away with it. But uh, because they dress, I mean, conservative Lutherans dress in the robes. I shouldn't say conservative, because there's some small Lutheran denominations that the pastor looks like a normal pastor. He doesn't come out there decked in a uh, uh, vestments like a. He doesn't look like a Roman Catholic priest. Missouri Synod, yes, they do. Oh, oh that was a shock. Uh, but the problem with uh, Lutheranism in general, that Luther's small catechism, which Luther was very proud of, uh, he was he thought it was his greatest work ever. But he he said that several times about different things. And I'm no expert on Luther. Oh, thank God! I thought about looking into that. I think no, that's 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 like learning Ar 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 Akkadian or some ancient language that is not relevant to anything. Uh, but uh, th this this uh, bipolar disorder in Lutheranism, where you have uh, salvation by grace alone through Christ, faith alone in Christ alone. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely true. Luther was right, but then he then he brings all the other baggage on the other side and and, and indoctrinates you into it. So you grow up, uh, and eventually you go through a catechism or like confirmation they call it. It's catechism. That's why you study. Uh, at least the Catholic catechism is this. Well, I don't know how big it. I think uh, who knows what the Pope has done with it now. Uh, he definitely he definitely had to redo it because John Paul's catechism, Paul the Second catechism, has has been. Uh, well, since Pope Francis has changed the word of God. <laughs> well, I don't like the Lord's Prayer. Let me alter it here to make it conform to my wishes. Talk about arrogance. What kind of guy is he? An antichrist. He opposes even the words of Christ. <sighs> Lead us not into temptation. He didn't like that. So, well, I don't think that's good. So I'm going to change it. <laughs> Yikes. Catholics! Flee! Just don't become a Protestant. Follow Christ. Follow Christ. Uh, but back to the catechism. So, in Sunday school, you know, all the Old Testament stories, Daniel in the lion's den, uh, David slowing, uh, stoning Goliath. Have you seen... Now, the, the Palestinians, the young men with their slingshots, learned something from that. Those are deadly weapons, although if you've got body armor on, they're not going to kill you. Uh, you get a hit, hit in the head with a stone, uh, bigger than a golf ball. Uh, you know, like, good-sized rock in the forehead. It's going to take you down, and hits other places are going to caused some damage. They were a military weapon. They were used. They had not only had archers, but you'd have uh, the Romans, too, have a whole lines of, of stone through sling. Guys with slings. And just showering. See, one rock, you can sort of see it coming and dodge it. But if you're looking, but uh, you get a whole shower of them, you know, you overload the defense systems and just like the uh, the uh, Hamas did with the uh, Iron Dome. They knew its weakness. Shoot enough rockets at once, some of them will go through, and you'll the Israelis will, will they lose? What well, those are pretty cheap. They're only like ten thousand dollars a piece for those, uh, those interceptors, Iron Dome. But still, if you, if you've got five thousand rockets coming at you, that's the it's going to go cha ching cha ching cha ching. That's why they're looking at lasers now. They they're only pennies a shot, but they don't work in bad weather. So all they got to do is just launch them in, a, uh, in the fog or in the rain, and they ain't going to work at all. Uh, you military guys did understand that, didn't you? Nope, they don't. And the atmosphere bends light all over the place, too. So the odds of getting a laser to work properly, now, nah. and the defenses against 
That is so easy. Just make the rocket rotate. Uh, you won't be able to heat it up hot enough. Unless you got a huge amount of energy. But even then, the, the atmosphere will bend it so it doesn't go where you point it. Uh, just look through binoculars over a hot surface sometime. It's, uh, rabbit trail. Okay, back to... Uh, back to But if, being raised as a Lutheran, so you got this bipolar disorder. You, on the one hand, you've got uh, uh, grace and Christ dying for our sins. On the other hand, you've got the Ten Commandments. But that's part of the catechism. The, the, uh, the main part of the catechism has to do with the Lord's Supper and Martin Luther's meaning of it, ex exposition of it, which was made it, well, he just made everything harder than it was in the scripture, uh, just like other Pharisees do. And then you have, uh, uh, okay, the Lord's Supper, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. No gospel. There's no gospel in the small catechism. I suppose they think that the uh, the uh, Apostles' Creed is the gospel. Not quite. Not quite. What does it mention? I, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Well, that's not the whole of the gospel. And that's the problem right there. So you're on this. Even as a born-again Christian, we do the same things. Baptists do this all the time. You, you, uh, you know that Christ died for your sins. You believe that. A born -again Christian believes that. They have confidence that Christ died for their sins. It's not like they have to earn their forgiveness. But then they, they're constantly being beaten by the law, saying this is how you're supposed to be, and we all fa always fail to measure up. So we're always going, oh, God, forgive me, I failed today. And it's a never-ending ritual. At least Baptists aren't like... Uh, Church of Christ, where every time you sin, you're lost until you repent and confess, which means you're lost all the time. Because you're <laughs> measured by the law, you're always in a state of sin. The, as Paul says, the law is a ministry of death. And so, but, but Baptists, Preach. Baptists try to live the same way Lutherans do, except not quite so bad. The pastors are always taking the Bible and turning it into law, into principles, living by principles. The word namus, which means the Greek word for law, also means principles. It's trying to, it's, it's by works. See, living by principles is living by works. They don't believe they're saved by works, but they believe they, they still have the attitude that are it drummed into them, just like Luther's catechism drummed it into Lutherans, that whether we're pleasing to God or not depends on whether we keep his Ten Commandments, for example. <clears throat> they don't go by the two great commandments because, why did Jesus point to those? Because it utterly destroys any hope you have of pleasing God through the law. The law is designed to slay you. To point to, as Paul says, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, for the law comes the knowledge of sin. All the law can do is reveal you're a sinner, which it does very well, okay? But the law is completed, it's fulfilled, it's done with, it's off the table. And that's what people don't know. That's not antinomianism, because we have a law, that law is Christ himself, in us. God doing what he wants in us. And that's what the new covenant is all about. And when God gives me the opportunity, I need to have a talk with the pastor at that church and try to gently inform him of the new covenant. Uh, point him in that direction. He has to discover it for himself. I mean, unless you, unless God leads you into it and teaches you, if it's just from somebody else, it's not going to do it. Um, it's something that, that, that God has to, the Spirit will lead you into all truth. And the church wants for you, 
this will revolutionize the pastor's preaching, and it will revolutionize the congregation. Once you understand the fullness of the new covenant and all the promises of God, that he will do these things in you, that he will give you a new, a new heart and a new spirit and write his commandments on your heart and cause you to walk in his ways. All this, God says, I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. It's not your doing. The new covenant is radically different than the old covenant. The law was about what you had to do. The new covenant is about what God promises that he will do. Including forgive your sins. All of them. All of them were completely atoned for in Christ 2,000 years ago. Then, they're, they're under the, they've been under the blood since then. The sins of the entire world. Okay, so that's... It's, it's a lack of understanding. You don't live by works. You don't live by principles. You live by faith. And strangely, and I'm, I'm speaking of ex by experience, the people that are Christians today that tend to do that more than others are the charismatics. Not that they're that they're uh, actually doing it right, but they they've stumbled on it by accident, not in their doctrine, but simply because of they're looking to the to God for what they want rather than trying to earn it. And because they come out of charismatics, don't come from Pentecostal holiness background, they they come from the dead mainline churches, like the Episcopalian churches and the Methodist churches. And so they don't they they've been they don't have the Old Testament law on their mind all the time anyway. So when you start from a position of paganism, it's a blank slate. But the, the, uh, not, their doctrine's bad. But they tend simply to go to God and trust God to accomplish what they're looking to see. Too often it's prosperity and health and that, focused on the flesh, not on God's real promises. But they're still doing it by faith. They're not trying to earn it. They're not trying to live by principles and law. And Baptists have to get past trying to do that. If if they learn and see, it's not that the Charismatics know what they're doing, but they they tend to be freer because they're not under the shackles of law and principles. See, I haven't lived by principles today. God forgive me, I haven't put on the full armor of God this morning. It's like. <sighs> Get over it. Lighten up. God set you. Jesus, what did he say? On the temple mount, at the temple, in the presence of the temple, which represents what? The law. The law of Moses. What does he say to the multitudes? He says, come on to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Weary of what? And heavy laden by what? The law, which they cannot keep. No one has ever kept the law except Christ. And I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy. The yoke of the law. My yoke is easy. As a, not Moses' law. His yoke is hard. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And when you understand what the promises of the new covenant are, you understand that. It's not about you doing it. It's about what God has promised to do in you. And when a church understands that, it will change the church. They will have true revival. They will. It's not even revival. It's simply entering into God's promises. If you don't know what God has promised, you can't have faith in it. So your faith is more like generic. God, I trust you to do to do what you may. If we don't know what his promises are, this is, the, the, Satan has been so successful in concealing the promises of God from God's people. And so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I just know that if, if 
some were to someone were to preach the new covenant to that church, if the pastor, preferably beforehand, would embrace that, it would revolutionize that church. Not that they need to be saved, but it would get them out from under the burden of trying to please God through living according to the law and principles and everything else. And no matter how you dress the law up, you know, still putting lipstick on the pig, uh, the law is, is, yeah, it's holy, but you're not. See, that's the problem. The law never give life. It's a ministry of death, as Paul says. That's his purpose, to slay you. It was just temporary. It's all been fulfilled. All the promises in the Old Testament uh, and, and the law, all the prophets are all fulfilled in Christ. Christ is the center of everything. And everything is in him. And I haven't quite worked all that out myself. But I know that's where it is. And including understanding the scripture, it's all fulfilled in Christ. And everything we have is in him. Our entire inheritance is in him. If a person is in Christ, they have everything. Salvation is not about the commandments. If you look in the New Testament, the judgment is whether or not you belong to Christ. That's it. If you're in him, you're saved. If you're not in him, you're not. 